In this week's episode of Studio Inter, we'll be reviewing the game against Atalanta with the man who commentated it, Mr. Patrick Kendrick. We'll be discussing all things Inter with him. Quick review of the Bologna game. We'll be discussing the flop and best Inter player of the season so far. This week's Monty Moratti and Fog and much, much more. Everything you're on Studio Inter on the Center Inter. Lautaro, grande palla per Barella, c'è tutto solo Michitarian, servito da Barella, entra l'area di rigore, turno 2, turno 2, Timur, palla per Di Marco! Bentornati, benvenuti to another episode of Studio Inter. I'm your host, Nima Tavarla Iruzzari, wishing you uh, back to an episode where we are much happier than we were a week ago. Um, a lot of worries have been dispersed. Inter finally beaten a direct rival. But before we get to all of that, um, before we do uh, start talking about this kind of, I don't know, not even mid-season, but a quarter season or a third into the season, I, I want to start by introducing my panelist. He writes a piece called Five Things We Learned from Inter This Week. This week, he wrote what we've learned from Inter so far this season, Mr. Jake Smalley. <laughs> You're just getting the hang of actually managing pr- to pronounce that right and then uh, yeah. throw a little curveball in there for you as well, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. good to be here. And he's the SemperInter.com preview writer, Mr. Mohamed Nassar. How you doing, Mo? Six points. Who the thunk it? Very, very happy. Can't wait to get to uh, sink our teeth into this pod. And we're also joined by a very good friend of the show. Uh, he's a, he's a Serie A commentator for the Serie A World Feed. He's he does also freelance work for the EU, BT Sport, and many many other out, outlets. Including he's doing handball as well, which me as a Swede, I'm, I'm really enjoying. Mr. Patrick Kendrick, how are you doing? Yeah, don't ask me to quote the uh, rules of handball, Nina. I think I could embarrass myself <laughs> there. But uh, yeah, I talk a good game, quite literally. So there we go. <laughs> Well, that's that's great. You were commentating on the Atalanta game, um, so uh, you you absolutely did watch this Inter's last game, and you would have a really good idea of what happened in the game. And I want to start with there. Simone Inzaghi said after the game that he thought the first 20-25 minutes Inter were, were struggled. I think that's being kind. I think Inter might have clocked some of the worst minutes of the season so far in those 20-25 minutes. But they managed to work themselves back into the game um, and 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 were on level terms going into the half. Um, I mean, if you were to compare this game and, and how much Inter struggled to other games where they've actually lost uh, but played better, um, wh- why do you think that this ended up going so well? Was it just, you know, one of those things? Or do you think that Inter actually, like Simone Inzaghi said after the game, deserved their win? I do think Inter deserved the win. Um, and I, I tend to agree. I think it was the worst performance I've seen from Inter this season. And I, I hasten to add, I haven't seen all of Inter's games. And I did a lot of Napoli's games in the Champions League reporting. And unfortunately, Napoli were paired with Inter. So they played the same night. So watching Napoli meant I wasn't able to watch Inter in Europe. So I've got that caveat out of the way. However, I've done a lot of their games domestically. And I'm pleased to say for the superstitious listeners out there, It's nice to occasionally commentate on an Inter game that's actually a win, having done the Derby and the Roma loss and the Lazio loss and so on, and the Juventus loss. So I was starting to wonder if it was me because, you know, (laughs) spending too much time with Neapolitans, they start to pin everything on you as some sort of, you know, very random, very random extenuating factor. But there we go. Um, I think Inter were poor. Absolutely right, Nima, for 25 minutes. And I think conceding the penalty was probably the best thing that could have happened to them. Um, I know we'll probably get on to, I have a feeling that Stefan de Vray, de Vray, de Vray, de Vray, whatever you want to call him, um, <laughs> is going to be the subject of one of your flops of the season. That's my mm. hunch, but I could be wrong. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, I mean, he, he lunged in there on, uh, on Zapata. It's exactly what Zapata was trying to do, just shift the ball, take the contact, win the penalty. Definitely a penalty, but naive defending from someone who should know better. But I think Conceding that penalty, conceding that goal was probably the best thing that could have happened to Inter because then suddenly they woke up a bit to the play with a bit more conviction. I've lost a, a headphone. Hang on, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> absolutely. God, it's all happening tonight. Um, they lost a... Uh, they actually then started to play football. Chalanolu got on the ball. And um, I love watching Lautaro and Dzeko play because it's like a throwback. I mean... If, honestly, it feels like 
flipped headers for a strike partner. I, I feel like that's football from when I was growing up, the mid nineties, and yet they mm. do it so well. They do it unbelievably well, so much so that two of the goals came that way. And um, I was speaking to Massimo Paganin afterwards. Oh, name drop. Um, <laughs> accented defender who was on the who was on the call with me, Nima. And um, as our transatlantic friends might say, um, yeah, and uh, in the booth, the broadcast booth. Anyway, I'm, get, I'm digressing again. Um, and, and, and I said to him, why is it that these flicked headers are so difficult to defend against? And he said to me, it's because most teams play zonal marking these days and people can just drift in. And it's, it's very hard, particularly if you've got good takers of dead ball situations and then to have that with, with Di Marco, who I will be getting later and will be ringing, uh, singing his praises. Um, and and Chalanoli, they have wonderful free, uh, free kick and, and corner takers. Um, and I think that that first goal was a real spark. And um, yeah, I mean, Dzeko's consistency in terms of scoring goals, regardless of his age, is just absolutely incredible. And I think just from there, Inter never really looked like they were going to relinquish control of the game. So some, sometimes you need that, a bit of a wake up call. You need something to shake you up. You need to be playing badly for, for everyone to suddenly take a look at each other and, and think, you know, what are we doing? Because that's why I was so surprised in the first 25 minutes. At no stage have I commentated on Inter this season and thought they can't play attacking football. They don't create chances. That's never been the case. And that's when I, start, I was starting to get concerned because I thought they've already lost five times this season. They're trailing. And what's more, they haven't created a single chance. Uh, on on Musso's goal, and then suddenly they reverted to to type and 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 became that sort of wonderful attacking force that that we've seen um, frequently over over the last season and a half under Simone Inzaghi. And you know, poor old Bologna bore the brunt of that, but even even Atalanta too. And and the best thing is there's so many goal scorers in that side, and there's so many different ways of scoring. Um, because I, I remember doing the the Derby Italian. Every time Inter got a corner, I thought, right, here we go, Inter are going to score. And then Danilo played out of his skin, won everything in the air. And then, so you start to think, oh, maybe they've lost a bit of that. And then they're playing against Atalanta, and Atalanta side, including Palomino, who looked a threat in both boxes, quite literally. Um, and, and he's very good in the air. And yet Inter are just, they have that. And I think that's the mark of, of a good team is winning ugly. And above all, if you're not playing well and playing cohesive, attractive football from open play, being able to come up with a goal where Chalanolu just puts, I know the first goal was from open play, but it was almost like a set piece. You know, they stood off Chalanolu, had time to, to put a ball in. Lautaro flicks it into an area and Dzeko gambles on it. And that finish, by the way, made to look so effortless, is a, is a lot harder than it looks um, from one of the most two-footed players in the league. But that's probably a longer answer than you bargained for, so I apologise. No, no, that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you about Stefan de Frey, or de Frey, or <laughs> however many ways we can say that, because to me, it's not, I, I don't, I think it's it's past the mental stage now. I think we are actually talking about a Handanovic 2.0 situation. We are talking about someone who, inexplicably, as a central defender, has peaked before the age of 30, because I think that he's been on a steady decline ever since he was named the Serie A defender of the season. Even during the Scudetto, Scudetto winning season, he was not Inter's best defender. I think Skriniar was better than him. And I think we, we saw a, de- a beginning of a decline. And then last season, it became very, very visual. And this season, he's been atrocious, except for maybe the Barcelona games and, 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 and so on and so forth. This is not the Stefan de Frey that we've seen these past few years. And it is a, a decline, like the Handanovic situation. Uh, only he's got an expiring contract and to have no money to bring a replacement in. And they and and they probably won't be able to afford to pay him a wage rise. If anything, they want, they'll probably want to lower his wages. Um, what, what what's your take on this situation? Do you think it's just you know no, he's been in a in a difficult you know period um, that that he hasn't peaked and he's not it's not a decline. It's all mental. Is it all of the above? What, what are your thoughts? I mean, he's never been blessed particularly with pace and, and, and nor has Skriniar. And I think that's always been slightly the, the Achilles heel, to be honest, of that inter back line. But it was concerning just seeing quite a, a, a I don't want to say a schoolboy error, but it was almost novice the way that he misjudged the bounce of the ball and that Hoyland turned him in the second half. And, you know, uh, clearly that's a yellow card because he was a long way from goal. Uh, Gasperini said in his press conference afterwards he thought it was almost uh, the last man, which again is 
um, a misinterpretation of the laws because the laws talk about denial of a clear goal scoring opportunity but we shan't get into semantics about the, dog so, of the game yeah dog so, dog dog so, so. indeed dog so <laughs> indeed absolutely um but what what I, what I would say is um i think you're right if i remember correctly divre as i call him is uh born in 1992 so he he must be turning 30 now ish um i think he's born later later on in the year um and so, yeah, you wouldn't have expected it at the time. It looked like a fabulous piece of business for Inter bringing him in on a free. And, and we could get into a broader discussion there where I almost think that Juventus and Marotta, by extension of that, had this almost obsession with being praised for working the Bosman market really well. And then it almost became a means to an end rather than, or rather it became an end in itself rather than a means to an end. Um, and occasionally we saw that, you know, with Juventus, with um, with Aaron Ramsey, amongst others. But so I think at the time when he was brought in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nino, but I think he was out of contract, wasn't he? And he, and he signed yeah. from from Lazio on a free transfer. That yeah. was seen as a massive coup, and it was because he's playing very well. I remember it was after the first season with Spalletti that that he came in. So we're now talking about so that's second season with Spalletti, two with Conte, one with Inzaghi. So he's now into his fifth season with with Inter. So I don't know if it's just a case of he's someone who needs a change of scenery every now and then, whether he's got a bit comfortable um, or whether he's simply going through a bad run of form. I don't think uh, he'll play much at the World Cup. I don't know if Holland play with the three at the back, but obviously they've got De Ligt and, and Van Dijk, who would probably be ahead of him in the pecking order. I'm not completely up to speed as to who starts in, in the Dutch back line. But I, I just wonder whether he's actually had his confidence knocked by... Inzaghi bringing in another of his old faithfuls in the shape of Acerbi, who, when I've seen him, has actually done fairly well and offers that versatility of being able to play both left centre back and as, and as the, the central figure in a back three. And, and I just wonder now whether Acerbi has more opportunities to play because Inzaghi's not always sold on Bastoni or Bastoni maybe doesn't have the fitness level to play three games a week, which is why we'd seen Di Marco frequently a left centre back. I'm not going to open that can of worms. But I think since Acerbi was brought in late on towards the end of the, um, of the transfer window, I think he's seen more playing time. He's now become that option to go to at left centre back. Then he comes into the side, maybe does well in that role, and then is seen as, a, as an alternative to De Vrij at centre back. And I feel like he's a confidence player, someone who needs to be backed by the coach every single game and say, OK, you made a mistake, but you're going to play every single time. Whereas occasionally, and we've seen it, I think Inzaghi has a lot of strengths. I'm not sure man management is necessarily right up there. And we've seen the way he's managed substitutions, in-game management, all of those sort of things. You know, the questionable usage of Lautaro Martinez last season, playing fewer minutes combined than, than Edin Dzeko, um, despite being Inter's top scorer. And Inzaghi would probably answer that and say he was Inter's top scorer because I kept him fresh by taking him off after an hour of every game. <laughs> but again, I'm going on a tangent. Coming back to, to Devere, I think it's... Um, I think there, there's definitely scope to keep faith with him. And I think you're absolutely right. I wouldn't be offering him fresh terms at this moment in time. What I would do is wait until the end of the season, take your chances. If he plays really well uh, and he earns a lucrative contract elsewhere, so be it. Uh, if he does really well and then he's enjoying playing with Inter and there's an improbable run towards the Scudetto or they go as far as the Champions League semi-finals, or they win another couple of pieces of domestic silverware and he's loving life in Milan, mm. then nothing stops him from coming back on the basis of those performances and saying, OK, I think I'm worth this. You know, can you can you meet my demands and, and maybe Inter call his bluff or maybe maybe they give him what he wants. So I don't see a lot of drawbacks to the situation. I think they're quite quite fortunate in that situation. I think there's several, aren't there, that are out of contract. I think D'Ambrosio is almost on a, a yearly retainer now, for want of a better word. Um, <laughs> I know that I know that Jeko has every interview he's been um, he's conducted recently. They keep asking him about his contract, and, and he's been non-committal on that. So I think, unfortunately, it's just the way that football is moving now. Players have a lot more leverage, uh, and 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 as such, can determine where their future lies and clubs naturally are less willing to part with a, with a transfer fee if they can get someone on a free transfer. So I think this is part and parcel of, of modern transfer negotiations, but maybe again, it is having an impact on him because you don't have, maybe he's expecting into to make the first move and say, okay, we want to sign you up to, to a new contract because 
when players do become older, they're only one injury away from retirement. And, mm. and that can be very expensive as well. So, I mean, there's a whole host. We don't know what's going on in his head. I still think he deserves um, faith in him. And I think he has a body of work in Intercolors that, that warrants respect and patience. Unfortunately, Inter can't afford to be too patient if it means conceding goals and dropping points because they've given themselves nowhere to go with those five league defeats already. Mm, for sure. I'm going to hand you over to Jake. Jake, if you had a question for Patrick, then the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a keen commentator myself, so it's really good to have a chance to speak to you. And I wanted to ask you, in the time that you've been covering Serie A, what has been the best game that you've called? Oh, that's a great question, Jake. And always nice to hear that people are keen on commentary. Um, I actually had the most incredible... Rather than one game, I picked two. I had the most amazing weekend um, a couple of seasons ago where I did, I believe it was Lazio 5, Benevento 3 on the same weekend as it was Cagliari 4, Parma 3. And that was one of the crucial games for, for Cagliari staying up. They scored two goals very late on, one from Gaston Pereiro and one from Alberto Cherri. And the Lazio game against Benevento was, was equally crazy. So um, I remember speaking to a colleague and he said, you realise you've just commented on 15 goals across two games. I don't think that's ever going to happen again in the same weekend. So, <laughs> so I think it was those, t- those two games that, that stood out. But one of, my, one of my earlier memories was doing a game because uh, I had a bit of a soft spot for, for Giampiero Ventura. Remember him, uh, his Torino side, because they had Cerci and uh, Andy Mobile. So clearly yeah. there's a common denominator here for Chiro. And, and they turned the game around. I can't remember who it's against. I have a feeling it might be might be Palmer um, again. Right. Uh, speaking of commentary, um, I mean, for me, <laughs> it, it's 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 um, I for me with, with Inter and you, it's it's um, it's Coppa Italia and it's quarterfinals and it, and Coppa Italia Milan Milan derby Coppa Italia and and the most iconic obviously is uh, go do your voodoo shit derby between Lukaku and ah, and, yes. <laughs> and Ibrahimovic which which was free broadcast on YouTube so I'm, I don't know how many people saw that and it was because because no one bought I mean yeah it, it's it's seen everywhere in the world I mean that was an iconic game but. <laughs> What do you what goes through one's head? I mean, when when you hear that, and also because it was COVID, it was dead quiet, wasn't it? So you could literally hear everything, single thing being held. Absolutely, and and you make a very good point there because the one advantage of COVID, I mean, I've heard back some 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 commentaries from COVID time, and however excited we were getting, without the backing track of the of the crowd noise. The goal just didn't sound the same, and it all sounded fairly pathetic, to be honest. I remember a great goal from from Zaniolo in, in Ferraro when he ran 70 oh. yards and beat about five players. And again, there was no crowd there to see it, and you're just almost in an echo chamber. And it was a similar thing there. What I would say about the the pandemic is the one benefit to it was being able to hear all of the instructions from the sidelines. And I took it upon myself, again, it's, I'm helped by the other side of my career that I have as, a, as, a, as an interpreter, I thought to myself, I'm finding this very interesting to hear what the coaches and players have to say being picked up by the effects microphone down by the side of the pitch. If I were a viewer, I think it would be nice to know what they, what they were saying. So I remember basically interpreting, albeit with a PG version, um, <laughs> taking out all the expletives, a big spat between Gasparini and Mihailovic when Mihailovic <laughs> managed to get Gasparini sent off. It was absolutely <laughs> fabulous. And and it was a similar thing, albeit with Lukaku and, and Ibrahimovic, the pair of them were speaking English to one another. So that was just great. I turned off the microphone because A, I wanted to hear what they were saying. Um, so if I had kept speaking over them, then I wouldn't have been able to hear them as well. Uh, and B, I just thought, well, I don't want to interpret this. I don't want to condone this. I don't want to condemn this. I'm just going to literally let the pictures talk for themselves. And, um, you know, and then everyone, there was the whole hoo-ha about what he actually said, you know, donkey and all of this sort of stuff. But essentially, it was just fascinating viewing. And I thought, wow, these two who are former teammates, former friends, people say the Milan derby is, is a friendly one. And, you know, there's always those cutaways to a, to a boyfriend and girlfriend or a husband and wife watching in the stands together. And, and there, there is less animosity compared with other derbies, say the Rome derby. 
But there was real needle between those two sides and they both really wanted to win, of course. And I thought it was just, it perfectly encapsulated, that subplot perfectly encapsulated the rivalry there was between those two sides. And and that was the game, I think, settled by the, the Ericsson free kick. Yeah, it end, was. Wasn't it? it was. So, I mean, it was yeah, no, fabulous. Fabulous memories of that. But I don't know if um, I got cut off to answer Jake's question. But um, yeah, I would I would definitely say those that weekend when it was Lazio 5, Benevento 3, on the same weekend as Cagliari 4, Parma 3, when Cagliari scored two goals late on to win a crucial match against another rival to beat the drop. Cagliari ended up staying up. Parma went down almost with that result. Late goals from, from Gaston Pereiro and, and Alberto Cerri, um, who never scores in Serie A. Um, and um, yeah, I, I I would almost prefer. I don't like to script lines, but occasionally I've thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if um, if Alberto Cherry had you know sort of good range of passing and and, and vision, because then you could call him Eagle Eyed Cherry. Oh my God! <laughs> oh my Dad God! Jokes are there. Oh there my go. days! Let's move on. Come on. <laughs> oh dear. And I was gonna, I was gonna talk about the famous what you, you refer to there about Sinisa yelling, "Oh, Giampiero, non puoi parlare, non puoi dire nulla ai miei, non puoi dire nulla ai miei." Ah, uh, that was it. Yes, you've, you've remembered it absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I mean, there, there's been so many good ones to be honest uh, <laughs> down the years. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, and another one that we had was. Maresca, sempre tu, sempre tu, Maresca. <laughs> Antonio Conte in Udine, a goalless uh, draw. Yes, I remember that. So Absolutely. Right, I'm going to hand you over to Mo. Mo, did you have a question for, for Patrick? And the floor is yours. Yeah, hi, uh, Patrick. Always a pleasure uh, being on the pod with you. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, so back to the inter-defense situation. Um, see, now, knowing what we know about Inter's uh, defensive malaise. Do you think that this is a side that can eventually compete for the Scudetto if they continue scoring as much as they do with the current state that the defense is in? Or do you think it's just uh, too far away? Well, I, I think you have to I think you have to tighten up defensively. Um, I know this is an Inter pod, so I'm you know basically swearing. But there's um, there's a team that are currently third in the league that have um, now won six matches in a row without conceding. And that's a team that in the past has overturned significant deficits by winning 15 <laughs> matches on the spin. For anyone not familiar with the team I'm referring to, it's uh, Juventus, specifically under Massimiliano Allegri. Uh, and I think Inter would have to do something similar. But in order to go on a winning run like that, you basically do need to keep clean sheets because you're not going to be able to score. I mean, Inter won in Florence, but they needed four goals to do so. Inter won in Prima, they needed to score three to get maximum points. So that's just not sustainable. However good you are going forward, you're not going to be able to average that over the course of the season. So I think for Inter to really have a chance of winning the Scudetto, a couple of things need to happen. First of all, they need to beat Napoli home and away, which is handy because their next match is against Napoli in the new year. Uh, Then they also need Juventus to help them out by beating Napoli a couple of matches later. But they need to they need to win the next 10 in a row, minimum. Need to find themselves within five to six points of Napoli and then hope that jitters, nerves, uh, superstition, um, Spalletti being a weak link, all of the rest kicks in and, um, and, and really creates this perfect storm of, of another Napoli implosion, the like of which we've seen in the past with... Ancelotti with Sarri with Spalletti's side last season as well. I think that's the only way to do it. I think whoever finishes uh, this is this is a real scoop. Hang on, now, Nima, you definitely want to clip this up for your socials. Whoever finishes above Napoli will win the Scudetto. You heard it here first. Um, but no, jo- all jokes all jo- all jokes aside, I think are into a better team than Milan potentially. Are into a better team than Juventus potentially. I think it's it's pretty much a toss up. Based on what we've seen in the first 15 matches of this Serie A season, there is one standout team. That does not mean that the same standout team will be the one that gets the most points over the course of a 38 game season, because you know a lot of things can can happen to Napoli and a lot of things can happen elsewhere, and Inter can really generate momentum. And who knows? Maybe Napoli have a great European campaign. Maybe Inter don't. Maybe Inter have a wonderful European campaign, and then that becomes this snowball effect and, and they just win every game between now and the season. 
you know, Benfica, admittedly, yes, you're going to talk disparagingly about the Portuguese league, but Benfica, who are very close to my heart, have gone 25 games unbeaten since the start of the season. You know, two of those games were against Paris Saint-Germain uh, and a couple of those were against Juventus. So it, it can it can be done. It can be done. Whether it whether it will be this season, I don't know. But we've seen we've seen Inzaghi's sides go on runs before. The lockdown season with Lazio when until the pandemic hit, what playing one game a week, they looked like they were going to actually pip Juventus to the title. And then last season with those eight games in a row that they won through the winter into into the new year. So it can be done. I just think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the gap is 11 points now. Yeah, um, to, Na- to Napoli, what, yeah. What, what you need to do, first of all, is you need to chip away at the sides above you. Whoever's in second place has a much greater chance. I mean, again, I'm stating the obvious, but first of all, you need to overhaul Juventus and Milan. Then you can focus on trying to reel in Napoli. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly where I am as well. So, but on that, on that, um, on that point, who do you think will end up winning it? Um, again, I probably shouldn't reveal this, but um, fate is a is a is a fickle mistress. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to just dip into my personal life slightly. I was due to get wed in the, uh, the southern metropolis of Naples, um, July just gone, and then we we bought a flat in Milan and stupidly decided to gut it and did renovation work. Um, Nima, don't clip this up for your socials. This is only for your diehard <laughs> listeners of uh, Sempre Inter. Uh, and unfortunately, and, and Nima knows this because we've spoken about it away from the pod, but unfortunately that took all, all of my time and attention um, and thankfully didn't have too much of an impact on, on my work. But um, we decided to put our wedding back a year. Um, and whilst when we did decide to put it back, Napoli were right there or thereabouts. And I thought, oh, it's a shame. They're going to win the league for the first time. And, and again, I, I hasten to add, because it's been put to me many times, I have no Italian team that I support. I'm completely neutral. Um, but I did think, oh, it would be nice to hear about this fabled atmosphere when Napoli win the Scudetto, which has only ever happened twice, uh, and late 80s and, and then 1990. It would be nice for my friends to be able to experience that, friends and family coming over to Naples for my mm. wedding. So from a very selfish perspective, again, I'm sorry, this is a terrible story that I'm telling. No, hopefully. it's great. It's very long winded. No, 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 no. It's anyway, great. It's I great. feel I'm a big, I'm a big believer in, in, in fate and the universe. Um, again, not very rational for an Englishman, which is probably why I shacked up with a Neapolitan in the first place. <laughs> and, and I have, I have a hunch. I have a hunch that Napoli weren't due to win the Scudetto last season. They're going to win it this season. And whereas I was due to get married on the 30th of July, by which three weeks more would have gone by this season. The the season finishes even later in June. Uh, I'm getting married on the 8th of July. And I thought all of my friends and family, as an added bonus, are going to see uh, Naples decked out in blue and effigies of uh, Kvitscha Karatelia all over the city. I could be wrong, but that's my hunch. And I I was very wary about saying Napoli were going to win the league, but from what I've seen over the first 15 games and the gap they've built up already, uh, I mean, they'd have to lose three games and Milan would have to win all the rest just for Milan to, to get above them as it, as it was. I don't no. think... I think Napoli are going to drop more than eight or nine points. Don't get me wrong, but I think, are they going to drop the 20 that they would need to between now and the end of the season for other teams to then perform and, and get it done. So again, it's, I'm not really reaching here. I'm looking at the table, seeing a big gap. Um, and I've been the first to caution against Napoli in the past. However, it just seems to be this um, synergy and this alchemy and uh, uh, whatever it may be. Um, and they've really done away with the, with the vestiges of the past psychologically and in terms of those those key players and, and there's a lot less ego um and also i'm um massively biased when it comes to the affections that i have for the head coach yeah luciano spalletti lucio <laughs> who, spallettone. Who, are, spallettone, who is one of the most underrated i think and, and sometimes very disrespected unfairly treated coaches so i think in terms of man man management and developing players i think he is one of the best in the world and i think his career speaks to as much i mean he was the first to play cancelo as a left back he he turned brozovic into a world class player he's doing the same with lobotka and anguissa not to mention zielinski 
Uh, I mean, I could go on all he day. He got Totti to score 26 league goals yeah. despite missing five penalties. Yeah, and then to be, win the he European got a 29 goal. goal season out of Maurito Icardi, one of your favourites, Nima. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he did. Yeah. No, he also th- resurrected uh, Salah's uh, career. Yeah, he did. Oh, yeah, here, here. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, and they, they all, well, I was going to say, they all speak very fondly of him, Totti notwithstanding. Um, but uh, I know <laughs> that Salah holds, holds Spalletti in a huge regard. I saw an interview with the, on, the, on the official Serie A channel with Richard Quadrelia, who spoke of Spalletti. And, I mean, wow, that, that's a love story. I mean, he absolutely loves Spalletti. Um, no, I, I think he's a, he's a fantastic coach. I think he's a very underrated coach. And I think for him, it would be the most, it would be the ultimate revenge for him to win the Serie A with Napoli. I mean, it's, it's a Sven Goran Eriksson, when I've interviewed him for the Italian Football Podcast, always says, when every time he 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 always underlines this one scudetto with Rome with any of the three with any club outside of the three striped ones in the north is worth ten with either one of them um, because it's that so is a great different. quote. Yeah. He always see, says ten is a lot more quotable than me. That is that is absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Succinct, concise, powerful. Oh, I'll tell you one more thing that uh, Paganin said to me yesterday during Atalanta Inter, and this was really telling. Um, and uh, Paganin went for, went for dinner recently with Spalletti and Giuntoli, so uh, it, it, they didn't necessarily talk football, but you know, he knows what he's talking about. He said that Spalletti is the one coach in Serie A that has experience of managing a long winter break from his seasons with uh, Zenit, so uh, mm, where he won true. two league titles, lest we forget. So he said, if anyone knows how to then resume a second half of the season after a long hiatus it's Spalletti so that was quite a quite a telling point and uh, yeah I'm not sure if I was supposed to quote him on that I might pass it off as my own consideration <laughs> the next time I commentate on Napoli but there we go fantastic thank you very very much for coming on and before we let you go there is a world cup coming on uh, starting soon um on um on uh, on Sunday I think this Sunday um this coming Sunday, we're recording this on Monday the 14th. So I wanted to hear, I mean, do you think it is Lionel Messi's turn? And or and what I mean, mean by that is I think it's Argentina's turn. They will win it. It will be thanks to the strong central line of Emi Martinez, Cuti Romero, Rodrigo de Paul and Lautaro Martinez. And everyone will praise Messi for it. Um, but I, I, I have Argentina as my favourites to win it. What do you think? I, I actually I tend to agree with you. Yeah, I was I was looking at some of the players that Argentina have called up, including a uh, controversial call up of uh, Nico Gonzalez, who's refused to train for Fiorentina for the last ten days, citing an injury which doesn't exist. But that's for another day and probably for a Fiorentina podcast. Um, yeah, I think um, I mean when you've got you've got uh, Lautaro, when you've got Messi, uh, when you've got Di Maria, you know, amongst all the other talented players that they have, I just think Messi on his own can win matches. Um, and who knows, maybe there is something with the stars aligning. Maybe it is a case of um, Argentina win the World Cup in the same season that, that, that Napoli Napi. win the league. Yeah, I mean, it's in the year the of AD to AD <laughs> after Diego. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, it's very hard to know because it's not. I mean, already World Cups are quite hard to call. Um, I think it's going to be even harder to predict given what time of year it's being played, where it's being played. You know, there's, there's just no, all of the traditional factors aren't really involved. You know, players aren't coming in off a fatigued season. Yes, there have been some injuries, but those are a lot more clear cut. There's no real dynamic in terms of base camp, travel. Um, you know, you'll have the usual dynamics of what's your path um, to the final and so on and so forth. But mm. yeah, I mean, I could, I could definitely see Argentina win it. Um, and, you know, they've won, they've won continental honours as well. So, yeah, yeah um, I don't think it's going to be France again. I've got a feeling it's a, it's a South American winner. So whether that's Brazil to end yeah. their whatever it is, that. 20 years of hurt, or whether it's Argentina <laughs> again. Um, but it, it, it would be quite, quite nice. I mean, to, to be fair, at least Argentina have won a World Cup without Maradona in 78. But um, Napoli have never won a Scudetto without Maradona. So, so maybe there is something in that. But yeah, I think such is, is the ability of Messi um, and such is the, is the fervour surrounding that, that footballing nation that uh, I wouldn't be surprised. As, uh, history tells us that outside of, um, outside of Europe, I think it's the, 
to South American countries. Although I think Spain bucked the trend in in, in South Africa, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Anyway, yeah, they did. Uh, and Germany you know, did. did. Germany. Brazil, so I'm, so I'm yeah. chatting. I'm chatting. No, no. But before that, no. But listen, 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 listen. But before that, that was the truth. I mean, that, that it was, it was that was the case before before Spain won it. That was how it was. It was only Brazil who won in Europe. True. True. So, 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 so we shall see. One thing I will tell you is it definitely won't be England. Um, and I'm even more convinced Connor, that it won't be Italy. Connor Cody. Connor Cody won't, doesn't do it for you, does he? <laughs> no, and I'm even more convinced it won't be Italy, unfortunately. So there well, we have it. So. <laughs> that's that. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. Very catty. Like that. Um, thank you very <laughs> much for coming on, uh, Ken, uh, Patrick. I really appreciate it. If, if people want to find you on social media, what's your Twitter handle and what you got coming up uh, so people can check that out? Yeah, it's at Patrick Kendrick, but there's only one K in the middle. So it's at Patrick and then Endrick, like uh, Endriki, the uh, the new Brazilian stage sensation. Um, so, yeah, that's where you can find me. And uh, thank you three as well. Always a pleasure and a ritual. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. We'll talk soon. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye. Right. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the um, the uh, Atalanta game. I want to start with you, Mo. Um, uh, I mean, we, we, Edin Dzeko continues to to score clutch goals. He scores difficult, scra- scrappy goals. He scores gorgeous goals, like against Bologna, which was reminiscent of the Zidane goal against uh, Bayer Leverkusen in the Champions League final, which which is a contender for the for the goal of the season. But then he he can't score simple goals and and he 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 misses sitters and and he struggles in in build up play and 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 that's more more to do with the fact that he can't keep up with the pace. I don't know, you know. Now it seems Marotta today say that you know Jekyll deserves to extend his contract. We want to extend with him. He said the same about Perisic. I mean, where are you on this? Do you think they will extend Paris the Jekyll's contract and do you want them to? It's a good question, Nima. I, I think ultimately it's, it depends on uh, what's going to happen with uh, Lukaku and what's going to happen with the replacement to Lukaku come the end of the season. It's uh, uh, the Zeko situation can be can be looked at or analyzed in in a vacuum. It's uh, as part of a comprehensive uh, striking four players or five players or you know whatever. I think Zeko needs to be a very useful uh, rotating. Player, he's a clutch player. I think he's got a good 25 minutes in him, so he can he can be brought in and provide a different look uh, towards the end of games, even in next season. But for sure, regardless, like I'll accept Zeko being renewed as long as there have been provisions done to make sure that Lautaro's main strike partner is healthy, fit, and available uh, 100%. Only then can Zeko play a role in, in, in an interest side, and I'm glad to have him on board. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Personally, I've made my feelings clear. I'm willing to accept that Edin Dzeko stays uh, and they extend his contract on the sole premise that Romelu Lukaku is not brought in on a permanent basis and that Marcus Turam is brought on brought in on a permanent basis. Uh, on a permanent basis, uh, Marcus Turam, who was called up for the French national team, although I don't think he'll play that much. But what he's been doing at, um, at Gladbach this season in the Bundesliga, not to mention the fact that the man was supposed to sign for Inter, uh, but injured himself. Everything was done, but he injured himself. And we ended up with this glorified uh, futsal player slash barbecue chef, Joaquin Correa who's not made anyone happy since making that move, other than Claudio Lotito, who who stood to earn quite a bit of money from that move. Um, but yeah, no, th- th- those are my two cents. What about your, where are you on this, Jay, Jake? What, what's your thoughts? Uh, I think it's clear at the moment. I think that he'll sign another 12-month contract. I really do. I think it's probably not the wisest bit of uh, business for Inter, I think, as much as he's playing quite well at the moment. And, you know, he's not really let into down massively when you take into account how old he is and the expectations, you know, certainly my expectations last month were really low. You know, he's <clears throat> he's coming into a place, Romelu Lukaku, 35 years of age, he had an underwhelming season at Roma the year before as well. So to anybody looking at that transfer when it was initially made, everyone would probably agree it was a little bit of a gamble. And he, he, I think he's played well 
the majority of the time he's been in an Inter shirt. But looking at his age, it just doesn't really make sense to me. I can't imagine he'd accept massively reduced terms either. But, you know, the, the biggest issue that Inter have got is their ability to recruit. I, I don't see Inter signing Romelu Lukaku again unless he manages to get himself to a real set of sharpness or a real strong run of fitness where he can actually score enough goals to warrant into actually shelling out for him. I mean, we don't even know what the situation might even be at Chelsea come the summer, whether Graham Potter will still be managed, <laughs> you know, whether he, whether he is managing and quite fancy bringing him back. So I think in the summer we'll see him to sign at least two new strikers. Um, and I, I do probably think that Dzeko is one that they'll try and keep hold of. I just don't think at his age, and given the fact that he adds so little, as you say, Nima, to the actual footballing, you know, etiquette that Inter are trying to sort of display, I just don't see it being worthwhile. He gets, you know, praise from me and lots of credit, but it's time to move on, in my opinion. But I really don't think they will. I think they'll sign into a new deal. And for him, I think he'd be a little bit daft not to take it because it'd be the best offer he'd get. Couldn't agree with you more. I think you you hit the hammer uh, on the head. We hit the nail on the head um, uh, for sure uh, on that. Um, uh, I, I think that that's exactly what's going to happen, and I and I and I think it's time for Jekyll and Inter to part ways uh, before you know. It's what is it they say? It's um, it's better to leave before you're asked to leave. Uh, and I think with Jekyll, it could really really turn sour because he's not getting any quicker. Um, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. But again, my my main focus is Marcus Turam. I think Inter have to get Marcus Turam. It's um, it, it's 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 a no brainer. He's the right age. Romelu Lukaku's pushing thirty. His 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 physical health and his fitness is an issue. Uh, is not worth the money. I mean, he's played less games than Paolo Dybala after after a quarter or a third of the season for crying out loud. Um, and and that's just not good enough. So I, I I would put my money on on Marcus Turam. That, that's where I am on that. Right. Um. I want to talk a little bit. I want to. I want us also to to um to name our flop of the season because my flop of the season, uh, so far I can't choose between Stefan De Frey and Romelu Lukaku so far. De Frey because he's so finished and he makes these schoolboy errors. Like what he did against Atalanta and and every and his behaviour afterwards. This hesitancy. You know, he's, 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 he's soon 30 years old. It's the kind of, you know, mistakes you expect from someone who's 18, 19 and doesn't have the experience of playing um, a, a senior level football uh, for such a long time that De Frey clearly and obviously and evidently has. Um, and so for me, it's an issue of you. Um, I, I can't choose between Stefan De Frey or Romelu Lukaku as my as my flops. I want to I want to start with you, Mo. What, what has been your flop of the mid season? Or, or so far, I should say, for Inter. Uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, it has to be Stefan De Vrij. I mean, I agree that uh, Lukaku has been a flop insofar as uh, his injuries and uh, whatever, but I mean, this is out of his control. Uh, De Vrij's la- uh, loss of form and the fact that I stuck out, stuck my neck out for him multiple times on the podcast <laughs> over the last few seasons, and he's made me look very bad. <laughs> I, I'm taking particular particular issue with the rise because uh, I mean if anything I feel like it's combined with poor attitude this season not just bad form but poor attitude and, and, and output which is uh, inexcusable so for me the is my flop of the mid-season so far by, by a, a country mile Jake what about you what, who's been your flop of the season I don't want to massively go too cliche. I don't want to agree too much with both of you. I mean, I did mention in this week's column that I thought Lukaku's been a bit of a flop. And, you know, like Mo said, though, I don't think it's necessarily down to his performances because when he's played, he's played OK. We just simply haven't seen enough of him. And I think it's more the transfer that's a flop in his case. I think we've absolutely butchered De Vrij to death, and rightly so. We did it for a large part of last season as well because he's been really poor since we, since the Scudetto win. Um, I'm going off a bit of an alternative view. I was sort of leaning towards Joaquin Correa, but again, it, it's just boring. Keep going on about him, and he just winds me up. Um, I've been really disappointed with Denzel Dumfries this season. Uh, I know it might seem quite a controversial call. I do really like Denzel as a player. I think there's some real quality in there. 
but he's really not kicked on like I thought he would. I'm just disappointed. I think more than anything, maybe calling him a flop's a little bit harsh, but I wanted to try and strike a bit of, bit of debate, to be honest with you, more than anything else with that shit. I just think we, we were spoiled a bit with Ashraf Hakimi. You know, I understand that. And even further back with Jao Cancelo. So, and Dumfries won't reach that level. He's never going to reach that level of play. But I was really hoping this season he'd kick on and he's just not, I've not seen an 8 out of 10 yet from Denzel this season. No, no, <laughs> no, you have not. <laughs> that's 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 an understatement. Um, uh, he's, I mean, he technically, he's a very limited player, and 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 it's a shame it is what it is. Hopefully, he has a fantastic World Cup and can finish the season with dignity at Inter, and Inter can cash in on him big time to a Premier League club, and they can buy uh, Sango from Torino, who uh, I absolutely think is the perfect replacement. Um, right? Who? Um, who? Uh, if we talk about the the player of the season so far, uh, I'll start with you, Jake. Who do you think who is who or Inter's player of the season so far? Who's that been, in your opinion? Mm, I'm glad I've got first pick this time. Um, I quite liked the way that Nicola Barella has gone about things this season, but I'm going to go for Federico Di Marco as my player of the season up until this point. Um, as a football romantic that I am, uh, I'm absolutely obsessed with the fact that he's born and bred into and to see a player who's fought to get to where he is as well it must be said he's spent loads of time out alone you know you forget and he made his debut for Inter <clears throat> under Roberto Mancini you know we're talking only seven years since he made his debut he's been in Switzerland out on loan he's played in the second division even when he was shipped out to Verona uh, under Antonio Conte, it was almost a bit as if it was lining him up to get a move to Verona or Torino. He almost went to it um, last summer. Um, so for him to establish himself in an inter team, I know he's had a couple of setbacks, but that's mainly down to the manager playing him out of position. But this last dozen or half a dozen games, he's been absolutely fantastic. I think that was really encapsulated with how good his performance was against Bologna. Uh, last week, so I'm going to go with Federico Di Marco. I'm, I'm really pleased for him on a personal level. I think he's playing some brilliant football at the minute. He adds an attacking threat in that wing back role, and his set pieces too are brilliant. I think he's been superb. That's that's a really good point. Um, I think he's he's absolutely having he's redeeming himself, but he's the, the defensive errors and his positioning mm, causing him to goals. Um, is why I can't have him as my uh, player of the season so far. Um, I um, I want to I want to go to you, Mo, before I reveal who mine is. Uh, who's who's been your Inter player of the season so far? I'm uh, I'm liking uh, Jake's uh, selections uh, being the controversial, both on the positive and the negative. I'm uh, I'm going to be uh, all uh, you know, uh, Jane Jane again and go with uh, Parella. Uh, simply for the fact that uh, he said it's uh, been quite uh, painful. So I'm going to stick with the straightforward answer of selecting Marella. Um Right. Uh, I, I, I can't choose between Lautaro and Barella. I think Lautaro, Lautaro's... Uh, consistently played at a high at a world class level or at least adjacent to world class even though he's had patchy goal scoring which i thought was behind him i think the level this guy plays at consistently uh, in the champions league in the serie a and, and, and i know a lot of people criticize him for being a patchy goal scorer but i kind of come to terms with that this is who he is so i look at kind of everything else and the fact that jeko has been able to score as he has and when Lautaro or whoever comes and partners him, if they can 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 up their and up their goal scoring, uh, you know, out out output. Look for me, Lautaro is just his 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 vision, his movement, his technique, his physique. This year he's improved on. He looks fitter and and healthier and stronger and everything. Uh, so I, I honestly think for me. Uh, him and Barella this season have I, ca I can't choose between them and I do want to give a massive huge shout out to Andre Onana who I think is going from strength to strength um, it's it's he's starting to show now that he's really warm he's really warmed up and, and and is really kind of getting into the swing of things and I thought against Atalanta that was his best game in an Inter shirt 
so far. Uh, I can't blame him for any of the goals. He didn't make a single mistake in that in that game, um, and he was close to saving that bullet header, which Palomino should never have been allowed to head if uh, if if Inter's defenders had done their job properly. Um, but no, for, for, so so I'm I'm really really happy about Onana as well. Uh, but no, I, I, Lautaro and Barella consistently have been outstanding this season. I mean, Lautaro's never been, never had a poor game. He's had bad games, but not poor. Whilst Barella struggled a little bit in the beginning of the season, and we did ask questions on this pod about, you know, what's going on and so on and so forth. But nah, Barella, Lautaro. So it probably has to be Lautaro, but Barella not too far behind. Right. Um, just briefly before we go to uh, Moji Moratti and Frog of the Week, I, I want to touch base a little bit about the Bologna game because I think that is such a key moment, um, Edin Dzeko's goal, not just because of the goal he scored, but the, when he does it, it's after him to go down to one of the most luckiest goals, I think, and comical goals I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, and 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 after the week they've had after the weekend where they lost against Juve again and, and things were looking they were under pressure again. To go out there and 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 for Jekyll to do that, what he did, and and to turn it around and then just completely rip Bologna apart, that was so important. And to do it again uh, against Atalanta and kill this nonsense about big games and direct rivals away from home, because uh, um, you know Inter now have you know all, all of the games that they've lost uh, except for Roma, they will have at home in the river in in the, in the in the second half of the season. Of course, the derby is you know they share the stadium, but you you both know what I mean. It's still 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 a fact. Uh, they start the game. Uh, they start the, the the season the year the new year with at home to Napoli. Um, so yeah, it's going to definitely be an interesting one. But but for me, I, I really want to just just really wanted to highlight that point about Jekyll and. And, and and that win against Bologna, which is so important. I hope that these five, six weeks, they work on the defence because Inter's defending at set pieces, defensive set pieces and corners, especially corners, it's it's not even schoolboy. I don't even know what to call it. There's more, I, I, I have no words to, to describe how poorly they're set up and I don't understand why. Um, right, let's uh, let's uh, move on to the part of the show where we pay tribute, rip the piss out of, and criticize someone or something heavily in the world of football, starting with the positivity. This week's Morati, which we presented by Mr. Positivity himself, Mr. Mohammed Nasa. He's, he works a lot, he's intelligent, and he surprises uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, quality. Yeah, so I was going to give the Moratti week to, of course, uh, the man uh, who we've been uh, loading and heaping praise on all uh, episode long, Edin Zeko. But seeing that it's a mid-season, uh, mid-season episode, I figured I might as well uh, give it to uh, Di Marco as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, seeing that, first of all, he's, uh, he's one of the players of the season that's selected by the, by the panel this week. But also because... Zeko and, and Di Marco are both players that we had criticized quite heavily at some point in time, like you noted just now, Nima, at some point in time in, in on the podcast, some point in time or other. So I think we have to, you know, if we're going to pay, pay our respects and dues to uh, Zeko, we might as well, we're obliged to do the same to uh, Di Marco. So both these players, for their improvement, for their contribution in the last uh, four-ish games, uh where Inter have pretty much salvaged uh, the chances of competing for uh, domestic silverware uh, come the ha- second half of the season due to their contributions. So I think these two guys need to be the Moratti of the mid-season and, and uh, the week. Couldn't agree more. Here, here. Right, let's move on to something much more comical. This week's Frog, which will be presented by Mr. Jake Small. <laughs> I'm really starting to get worried about our reputation with these. They get a bit out of control. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be honest. I think in terms of the best thing I've heard this week is something that came out this morning. Um, obviously, with the winter break or the break for the World Cup, uh, so to speak, there's an opportunity for some of the smaller clubs down the pyramid to get more involved 
uh, in the spotlight. And in England, that's been the case this morning, where six tier side Ashton, uh, Ashton United, sorry, I nearly said Ashton Athletic, leave them lower down. Ashton United have made a cheeky little bid for Erling Haaland. And I, I read this this morning, I thought, oh, right, okay, this is just a social media stunt. But they have actually uh, made a concrete approach. And what I think I found the funniest is one of the conditions that they stated was they'd really like him to come on the Christmas do. And uh, having been to University of Manchester uh, and Ashton being quite close by, I do know it very well. And uh, the thought of Erling Haaland going a night out with uh, part-time footballers from Ashton United is a fantastic idea. So I hope the City accept and we get to see uh, <laughs> Erling Haaland play against Bamber Bridge, one of my local teams, um, <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> so, excellent. Oh, that's fantastic. Right, uh, let's move on to something much more negative. This week's Modgy, which I'll be presenting myself. This week's Modgy can't be anything else other than the refereeing in some of the games we've seen this last week. Um, how... Uh, and for me, how the Serie A want to salvage this. I don't know if you've all seen the highlight package from Milan Fiorentina, but there's a, there's a situation where Fikayo Tomori absolutely brings down Jonathan Iconé. And when I, when you watch the game live on TV, you, they show it from the front, from from from, from, from where you see the the like from the from the angle where you see the players from the front, right? Where you can literally see that first. Tomori takes the man and then the ball, which makes it a stonewall penalty. But the Serie A have put um, <laughs> put the from behind where you can't really determine that. And that to me is just fantastically dishonest. Now, at the same time, it could also be the fact, because I don't know the VAR protocol. I mean, we've seen some really dodgy decisions. You know, Ju- Juventus, Saler- K- Kandreva situation, Salernitana situation springs to mind whether or not they had the image available to them, which is insane. If, if if the TV producers can have the images, then why in God's name does VAR not? So th- that's one thing. But but so so we don't know. I don't know. I've looked it up and I've, can't, I've found I've not been able to find a conclusive answer. But these these decisions are just it's it's embarrassing because it's it's not you're not allowed to make these mistakes when you have video assistance. I'm sorry, but I mean, if, at the blink of an eye, I have more understanding of all the understanding in the world for it. But I could, don't have the under, I have any understanding for this when you've got video assistance and 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 you choose to use the footage that absol- that that doesn't show what happened at, or what really happened when there is footage that show what actually happened. I mean, it's it's astonishing. It's genuinely bizarre, and you know, it's it's the Serie A. Sometimes you know, I love it, hate it. It is what it is. Right, that's all we have time for this week. That's all we have time for this. Uh, well, that's all that we're going to take a little break now uh, until January because there are no games being played. It's going to be a World FIFA World Cup uh, in Qatar. That's going to start by the end of this week, as we said. I've already said that I think uh, Argentina are going to win it, uh, but I am rooting for Iran for obvious reasons. Um, but before I before I uh, let everyone go, um, I asked Pat Patrick, and he said he thought um, Argentina was going to win again. But I'd like to thank Patrick as well, and I'd like to thank you, Mo, um, for for coming on and for this beginning to the season. And who do you think is going to win the World Cup? Uh, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Um, I think it's uh, like Patrick said that's a South American side. I'm uh, rooting for Lautaro. So I'd like Argentina to win, despite my distaste and dislike for uh, a certain Lionel Messi. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't be too upset if Brazil win it uh, either. So I, I just I hope it's one of these two. I can't stand to see another European side that's not Italy win uh, win the World Cup. So that that's who I'll be rooting for. Nice one, Mr. Jake Smalley. Thank you for coming on. And who do you think is going to win the World Cup? Yeah, thank you for having me as always. Uh, I think it's really rude that nobody's think well, nobody's mentioned England. I mean, I've absolutely no doubt that England will win the World Cup. <laughs> I, think, I think Connor Cody with a hundred and twentieth minute winner in the final, a bicycle <laughs> from a half or something like that. I'd imagine that would be something 
but realistic. But, uh, oh dear. <laughs> no. As as someone who has in, as as an Iran fan who's got England in the group, I I cannot begin to explain how thrilled I am that neither Fikayo Tomori or Chris Smalling have been called up to the England squad. <laughs> I, no, I'm absolutely. If they don't play in the Premier League, there's no, there's no. Yeah. If they don't play in the Premier League, they must be rubbish. So yeah, Prem you know, Cody's right. better. He plays for Brexit yeah. in FC. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Argentina win it for me in a, in a serious statement. I think they'll win it. I, I hope they do. I, I really like a lot of the, the players they've got in the squad. Rod- Rodrigo de Paul as well. Mm. Gorgeous, gorgeous player. Gorgeous little player. For Inter, but, yeah. Yeah. In, in, a, in an alternate universe, Antonio Conte is still coaching Inter, Rodrigo de Paul has come in, and Christian Eriksen is there as well, uh, and Lukaku and Hakimi. Anyway, let's leave our fantasies aside. Uh, it, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and for and up until this, uh, you know, this little, the first part, first third of the season. We will be back uh, after uh, after the Napoli game. Uh, 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 on our usual spot on Mondays in early January. Until then, take care of each other, take care of yourselves, uh, and may your may your countries in the World Cup, all of you who have a country in the World Cup, best of luck. And uh, until next time, take care of each other, and sempre e solo, forza Inter.